And uh, as Keith was giving you a little introduction, you know, God has a great sense of humor because John and, and Anna came down. I was actually giving a parish mission. My co-worker, Father Kevin Scallon, wasn't able to be with me because he had to go home to Ireland because of sickness in the family. So I had the parish mission, and it was in a place, kind of, you would say, in the boondocks, you know, um, quite a ways from, I think, Jacksonville. But anyway, I was there, and uh, the priest, a lovely Polish priest, but you know, men are not the greatest cooks, <laughs> not all of them. And so this dear father, well, he was, a, as the say he was a lovely man. But he didn't put too much stress on food. And uh, I thought to myself, you know, I don't really know much about this kitchen. And I said, well, you know, Jesus, I'm sure there's plenty of people out there who would have liked to invite sister to lunch. <laughs> and which I don't do because when we have a parish meetings, I'm very busy. And, uh, but anyway, sitting in front of me was this, I thought he was an Irish man, redheaded gentleman and his wife in front pew. And sure enough, they asked me, would I like to go to lunch? And um, I think I shocked them. I said, oh, I'd love to. <laughs> and, uh, you know, we, it was hard to find a place, you know, a nice place to, but we did. But, you know, I have to tell you, if you don't know this, John, I don't know his last name. I sat in awe of what God's miracles have worked through him. And I thought, hasn't the Lord a great way of, he not only give me my lunch, but he give me this marvelous testimony of what God had done in John and Anna's life. And so he said to me, he started telling me about Keith and Anna, about all the things that were happening in Ottawa. And uh, even though you know, we probably did get the letters, and it's very hard because we work with priests a lot, so we give them the priority to the, the, the priests and, and bishop where we minister. But anyway, I put it in my head, and I thought, oh, I have to go to what? That man really convinced me. I'm not going there for myself. I'm going to be renewed, all the good things I heard. So that's why I'm here. And so far... Thank you, John. And there's two friends of mine walking in who are Brazilian, who are with me in the Holy Land this year, so I know two people here. <laughs> Welcome. Now, I'd like to begin by asking the Lord uh, to, to bless us all, as he said, this day. And this morning, I'm going to talk to you about um, the Eucharist. In the afternoon, I will uh, continue and I'll speak a little bit about, um, you know, the, the mercy of God, but also um, I have to mention our Blessed Mother. But this morning, I want to speak about the Eucharist. So let's pray and ask God to give us a great, <clears throat> a great love. This is the most beautiful gift. There is nothing can compare with the Mass. Nothing. That's why I... I feel that it, we have to open through the Holy Spirit to the real depth of what gift we've been given in the simplest way. And God will help us to fall in love with the center of our faith, this Holy Eucharist. So let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you. I thank you, Jesus, for this day. Jesus, you are alive. And you, Lord, have told us, I will come to you. I will make my home in you. The Father and I will dwell within you. You said, I am your bread of life. You said, those who eat my flesh and drink my blood will have life and have it in abundance. You told us so many beautiful and made so many beautiful promises to us. But the greatest gift you give to us was to give your life, that we might have life. So this morning, I, I beg you, Holy Spirit, anoint my lips and give me the grace to be able to speak about something so awesome. 
put your words in my mouth, that all of us may know and be filled with gratitude for the gifts that we receive. We ask this, Mary, we ask you as a mother, you who carried Jesus, you who are the first tabernacle, you who stood at the ultimate sacrifice of Calvary as a mother, you, Mary, who received us as your children, we ask you to help us to understand the Eucharist, to help us to love the Mass, and to be willing to give our lives for this great sacrament. O sacrament most holy, O sacrament divine, all praise and all thanksgiving be every moment thine. Amen. And I'm going to begin with a story because, of course, stories illustrate the best way, you know, um, to get across a message. As many of you know, I, I'm sure if you've read my book or I'm around for, for years, I um, was healed myself, and yes, I received the gift of healing. I was a very, very reluctant candidate because I told the Lord I want no gift of healing to keep it himself. I was a happy teacher, and I was, you know, I have to say to you that the healing ministry, it may be like seem a contradict, but the healing ministry for an individual can be a very dangerous ministry. Do you know why? Because people make false gods out of you, or people make you into a celebrity or a star, or, you know, um, you see these, you know, big sessions and, you know, like God's man of the moment or God's woman of the moment, and you know, people say to me on television, you know, and any time they'll say, oh, are you the famous nun? And I say, no, I work for a famous person. <laughs> and uh, they kind of look at you, you know, and they're, do you know him? <laughs> anyway, <laughs> one day, um, so after I got into the ministry, and, and I thank God for my religious life because, you know, sometimes... It's difficult, it, like say, in, in, in life, to know, well, is this God's will? And uh, I was very blessed because I, I live in a religious order. I'm the Sisters of St. Clair. I have vows. I, I took vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. And a lot of people in our world today think, oh, they're binding. I mean, my God, why would a young girl, if these beautiful young girls here from um, Mother Bernadette's the community, uh, of the Queenship of Mary, why would, would it take them? Because they liberate you for Jesus. They liberate you, uh, you know, they set you free, that you, you're, you're free to do God's will in a, in a beautiful way. So when I received the gift of healing, it wasn't very hard because I was a teacher and I, I knew. I heard like, one day at a prayer meeting God saying to me, just be obedient to authority. And I would work through them. It may seem impossible, if it's as well. And so um, I was very blessed in the Ministry of Healing, but I have to tell you, in the beginning, the principal of the school where I taught was a nervous wreck because, oh my God, tell nobody, there are all kinds of people that'd be looking for you in the classroom. <laughs> so, but I, I wasn't upset. I, people say, you know, did anybody ever come up to you and say to you, are you in full-time ministry for the Lord? And I look at them, and I thought, oh my God, I have 56 first graders. I really am in full-time ministry. <laughs> Anything we do is ministry, if it's for the Lord, it's full-time. Anyway, but eventually, when the miracles started happening, and, you know, people, my name went out, you know, in different places, I began to realize people were coming to me because, and they didn't go to Mass. They were Catholics, a lot of them, and they didn't, um, you know, they would say to me, I always remember in Tampa, uh, somebody coming to me, he was in a very important position in government, and uh, I mean, he didn't have a very good life, but I'm listening to him, and I said to him, well, you know, uh, John, I'll pray for your soul and your body, and he looks at me and says, oh, I don't worry about the soul, it's the leg that's killing me. <laughs> so, I thought to myself, 
you know, and then you had, uh, you know, people, um, no place better than Ireland, um, looking for wee relics of the nun. And, you know, uh, we have people in Ireland, you know, travellers, beautiful people. Some of you would be familiar with them. They call them gypsies, but they're not really. They're displaced people from their land and they take to the road. But they're always coming after me. So I went on a pilgrimage to Lure with a couple of friends. And the reason I went to Lure because I was beginning to realize that I was becoming, I could become very easily proud. You can think, oh, look, well, miracles would happen. Like the apostles, people want to, you know, give you, oh, thank you, as if it was you. So I went to Lourdes, and I only had one prayer to Our Lady. I went up to the grotto. Now, it wasn't that I didn't believe in healing, and it wasn't that I didn't, I had received, you know, the grace to say yes to this call, which could be very demanding at the time. But I went to ask our Blessed Lady for one intention. And that intention was to keep me in the heart of my Catholic faith. That I wouldn't be on the preliminaries, you know, and that I would be, that I said, you know, I don't want to be somebody that's, you know, gone off like, you know, that I'm not in love with my own faith and that I forget what is important. Because healing is not the most important in my ministry. And neither is it in anybody's. The main, more, my most important is to grow in holiness and to be a saint. And that's tough work. We know that for all of us, no matter what you do. So I went to Lourdes. And it was while I was in Lourdes that I got this grace. And I saw, you know, um, the people all there flocking to Our Lady, but also to the Eucharist and the Eucharistic processions. And the miracles, most places where Our Lady appeared, uh, practically every place, the Mass, the Eucharist, adoration, confession, are the center of the apparitions. And that's why I love Medjugorje. I go to Medjugorje a lot, no matter what anybody. I've been going since the beginning, away back in the beginning, because what I see is young people sitting for hours in front of the Blessed Sacrament, people lining up to go to confession. We see, that that was my desire for a lady, that I would be able, through this ministry of healing, little did I know what she was going to answer my prayer. Because shortly afterwards, I came back to the United States, and I was very touched by Lourdes. And one day, a Jesuit priest called me, and he said to me, Sister Breach, I'd like you to come to pray with my poor in Juarez, in Mexico. And I said to him, I was on my way out to California or someplace, and I said to him, oh, you know, Father, I don't really have a lot of time because I'm just, you know, I have to go to California and such. He said, God doesn't need a lot of time. And he was, um, he was actually from Florida. He was a Jesuit, like your bishop, and like the Pope. He was a Jesuit, and he, was, he had a very, very prophetic ministry because he heard God calling him to go to the into Mexico across the border to um, feed the poor. And it's a beautiful story. Father Rick Thomas, some of you may have known him. But anyway, Father Rick was a really, I would call him, a wild charismatic. I mean, in the airport, he, he went, when I came, he said, Hallelujah, you're here. People are looking, you know. <laughs> but anyway, he was a fool for the Lord, I'll tell you. So he took me to Juarez. And it, when I went to Juarez, he said to me, I, I stopped off for 24 hours on my way out to California. And he said to me, Now, Breach, they don't, these people, I'm going to bring you out and show you. Um, this is the Lord's Ranch. And this is, he was telling me all these names. And he said, these are God's beautiful people. Now, he said, we're going to have Mass. But he said, it's not in a church. It's on top of a garbage dump. Because that's all the place they have. You know, this has come back like 30 years ago or something around that. But it, what they were doing was, as you know, coming across the Rio Grande, and they were driven back at that time. And they were squatting 
and they were having children. It was just terrible. Anyway, he said, now we're going to have Mass there, and I'll get you to say a prayer after communion. But he said, you know, it's not important to know who you are. He wasn't into introductions or anything. Well, my mind, this is how we're programmed. My mind is saying, these people are starving. They know nothing. What will they know about the Mass? How can you feed hungry people? How can you give people, you know, this is, this is what, what, you know, people were saying. And what I was saying in my heart, you know, because you hear people saying, well, you know, you have to feed the poor. Sure, you have to feed the poor, but you have to feed the poor also, the poor soul. You have to evangelize them. Because, I mean, this is the, this is the dilemma and this is why people get guilty and when they hear people saying, which people are called to go out to the missions and people are called. But you know, Mother Teresa said about the United States, it's the poorest place in the world. Spirituality, morals, think about the poverty. Well, anyway, I go there with my mindset and there was about maybe, maybe a thousand almost, I couldn't count, but there were people every place. And Father had with him uh, a little uh, table, and he'd all the, we needed for the celebration of the Eucharist, and he brought a few young Mexican-American guitarists, and he set up the table for Mass. Everything was per, you know, spotless, and he had set up on this mound, and all the people were standing around. And I'm thinking, oh, it, it was really, really an eye-opener to this, this scene and the poverty. So anyway, um, we were about to start Mass. They started singing, and brothers and sisters, their singing was out of this world. And they were rejoicing and praising God. And then it came time to begin, just before Father came to start the Mass. All of a sudden, there was a, lots of racket and noise, and what emerges up the aisle of the center of this, where they were in the semicircle? A woman, a small little woman. And she was carrying a, something on her back. And I thought, she's carrying for uh, the priest. She's bringing a gift. That was my first thought. But when she put it in front of this table, it was a child, and he was completely burnt. The skin was off his body she found it was a little Indian Mexican woman and coming across the mounds of stump and whatever else she came, she found him smoldering. It was very cold, I remember that. She found him smoldering. He tried to light a fire and it engulfed him. And she was able to put to get him out but his skin was all burnt and he was dirty. It was terrible looking and he was screaming. Can you imagine when she rolled him up, the only way she could do it was she put him on her back and carried him. And she put him in front of the altar and she looked at the priest. She didn't know who I was. And she said, Father, please bless him. I found him smoldering in the, in the garbage. You know, I'm looking and I'm thinking, my God, there's no doctors. We're not near any heart. There's nothing. And Father and myself, we said a brief prayer and Father Rick said, put him under the table. Put him on there and we'll go on with Mass and we'll pray for him at Mass. So we put the little boy, put the little boy and the Mass started. And as this came to the glory, they were saying the Gloria. I'm looking at them and I'm thinking, these people are praising God. They have nothing. They, you know, because many times we only praise and worship Jesus and the Holy Trinity is when we have things, when things are going well. They had nothing. Then, when it came to the consecration of the Mass, I was standing to the side. And I was, I had my eyes closed as Father was, was, was saying the words. And when the bell, huge, loud bell, the, the rang this bell, and I looked up. And everybody was prostrate. Like the, you see, you know, you often see these Muslims with their heads there. Well, the whole sea of the dump, they were all there. But I was looking, and the moment I looked at the host, it was like we had this morning. You know, brothers and sisters, for one instant, and I know it was interior, but it was real. 
Willow Street, I saw this magnificent picture of Jesus. It was two ha- in the host, it was two hands out saying, Come unto me, all you who live and are burdened. Come to me. At that moment, these people lifted their heads up. And with the most radiance on their face, they said, Viva Christa Re, long live Christ our King. And I knew, brothers and sisters, from looking at their faces, that they knew that this is Jesus. That this is Jesus, not as St. Faustine said, he's not an object, he is a living person. And we as Catholics must never, ever allow ourselves to be evangelized out of this. This is Jesus, body, blood, soul, and divinity. And at the moment I looked at, at, at their faces, I noticed this little fellow who was screaming. There was no sound from under the table. We finished the Mass, and, you know, it was so reverent to watch them. I was looking at them. And I remember looking at a, a young girl who had come in with her, with her a, a little baby, actually, in a mother's arms. And... She was Down syndrome, you would know by the features. I, I, why God led me to certain people, I looked at. After Mass, when Mass was over, I went around to see this little fellow, and he wasn't there. And I went over to the woman, and I said, where is he? And with a big smile, she said, there. And he was healed. And me, supposed to be there to pray with him, I said, what happened can you imagine how ignorant we can be? And she looked at me, and she said, what do you mean what happened? Didn't Jesus come? <clears throat> at the words of the consecration, when you see today the bishop put his hands over the bread and wine and call upon the Holy Spirit that this bread and wine will become the body and blood of Jesus. The body of Jesus. At that moment, not only on the altar during the consecration did, you know, the bread and wine change to be no longer bread or wine, but to be changed. The little boy was changed, totally healed. That day, that little Down syndrome child was healed. I didn't pray with anybody. I spent eight hours on the mountainside, and I was in awe of the miracles at the Eucharist. I hadn't done anything. I, it was mass. But that night, I went back across the border, and I stayed um, in, in the Jesuit residence in El Paso. And about three o'clock in the morning, you know, I was brought up in Ireland, culturally Catholic, like a lot of places in Canada, you know, where everybody went to Mass, everybody went to devotion. You know, back in Ireland, when I was growing up, Catholicism was in, you know, everybody went. It was Catholic. And so I went to, we went to Mass. In one way, you went to Mass to fulfill an obligation. In another way, the neighbors would be horrified if you weren't going to Mass, you know? So you, and that's still, you know, and a lot of people, they go to Mass because so-and-so would be saying, you don't go to Mass. But anyway, I'm there, and at 3 o'clock in the morning, I was very disturbed. I felt the Lord saying, get up and pray. And so I got up. And I knelt at the side of my bed, and I was really saying to the Lord, Lord, why did you bring me here? And then a flashback to his mother. And then I heard these words. I brought you here because people will travel all over the world seeking individuals. People will look for signs and wonders. People will go to other places. And I'm on the altars of the Catholic Church. And I'm in the tabernacle. And every Catholic, every one of my children, and those who will come into the faith, have the privilege of not looking at me, but coming to me personally and receiving me. I want you to go into the world, and I want you to speak on the Eucharist. People don't know how I long for them 
to come to honor me. I'm alive. And so I made a commitment, and that's like nearly, nearly 40, 30, I'm, I'm 42 years in the ministry with Father Kevin for priests, and it was just before that. So it's many years ago. And brothers and sisters, all I can tell you, and I'll speak a little bit more about miracles and healing later, but I have to say to you as Catholics, and I say it, you know, whenever non-Catholics come, and I have great respect for people of other faiths, of Christian faiths. And, you know, I always say, like a pastor said to me, one time a priest, one time in the parish said, you know, Breach, there's a lot of Pentecostals here, so um, what are you going to speak? And, and I'm sit looking and I'm saying, well, I'm going to speak on the Eucharist. And he kind of got a little uncomfortable. I said, don't worry, Father, if they don't know about us, they'll know after I finish with them. <laughs> but you know, two, two rows of those Pentecostals we're all lapsed Catholics. And they came up to me afterwards because, you know, they had left for feelings and for the emotions and for the na good things and good preaching, and that's all wonderful. So now, that's a long introduction, but now I'm going to tell you, what is the Eucharist? Well, first of all, you ask yourself the question, why for 2,000 years, 2,000 years, the, the Eucharist, this, this sacrament, has been the prime target of Satan. The Eucharist and the priesthood are like a hand in a glove. And these two sacraments, since the very beginning, because remember, when the apostles went out, from the very beginning, they were persecuted. The persecutions are, they weren't very long proclaiming Jesus as the Lord and Savior. They weren't very long when they would meet together for to celebrate, to break bread for the Eucharist. Why would it? And there's two saints I love because I think of them, I visited, um, well, of course, I'm Irish, so one of them, the Irish, we have loads of martyrs. We have, any of you with Irish ancestry, there are martyrs, young people, teenagers, who dressed in priesthood and went out and, left the, and died to preserve, the, to protect the priest so he could say mass in the hills and holes of, of, of the mountains of Ireland during the penal days, during the Cromwellian persecution, and way back in other countries, all over the world. And there was one woman in Ireland who stands out because, you know, it, it reminds me of today's world. This mother was an Irish woman from County Meath, and she married into a family in Dublin. And there were, there were well, well, comfortably well off. And she had a son who was very ambitious. And her son wanted to be the mayor of the city of Dublin. Named, the woman's name was Margaret. And Margaret Ball. And Margaret, at that time, you couldn't be in any position if you were Catholic, because by that time, Ireland was now under England, and it, 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 they had the prayer book, as they say, and the Catholics were being persecuted, and they had no rights whatsoever. So here's this young, well-educated man, and he wants to be, he's a Catholic, but he gave up his Catholic faith. Ambition, you know, and we say to children, you know, you have to have some ambition and, and get on in life. But there's an ambition that's detrimental to the faith and to our salvation. And that's what's wrong, I hate to say it, in our governments, in our parliaments, where many of our Catholics, to, uh, to get into power and office, are willing to forgo every moral issue and everything that belongs to Christianity. And that's detrimental to salvation. Now, Margaret was very disturbed by her son, uh, and she, so she tried everything. So she would bring in priests who were on the run in Ireland from the continent to try and get the son, you know, to re-evangelize him back into the church. But there was no, you know, one of the, the, the fearful things is everybody has a free will. God doesn't force us. We, and this is why when people say, 
God doesn't send anybody to hell. No, he doesn't. We choose. It's a free choice. We all talk about free choice. We choose where we're going to spend salvation. God will give us every grace and every opportunity and will do everything and send his mother and send the saints and make it, uh, you know, send an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But in the end, we choose. So, Margaret's son chose to denounce his Catholic faith, became a Protestant. And he went to, he went on to become Lord Mayor. And he had his mother arrested. And she was dragged through the streets of Dublin as an old woman. Why? Because she wouldn't renounce her Catholic faith, the Eucharist especially, nor the priesthood. And there in Dublin Castle, she died, and people probably thought she died of, of, of cruelty at the hands of her own son. That's, that's how evil, there's a wrong ambition. You kill your own, as we see it in many countries. You destroy anybody to get what you want. She's one woman, and thank God St. John Paul beatified her when the martyrs were beatified when he was some years ago. So she's not forgotten. She's a saint. Then you cross over to England, which had a terrible, and you know, we Irish, we're not too much in love with England, but I love England. <laughs> but, you know, people, people say to me, where are you from? And I tell them, oh, I'm from occupied Ireland. They say, who's occupied? They say, Britain. I'm in Northern Ireland. And, but England has a wonderful history in the Catholic Church. Absolutely marvelous. They have martyrs, priests, when you read the stories, of what went on in England during these cruel queens and Henry VIII and Cromwell, you read what Catholics, and it was the laity. Always remember, you know, and this is why we have to pray for our church, we have to pray for our priests and our bishops, because it was, it was all the bishops stepped over to Henry VIII's and, and avo left the church, the Church of England, except John Fisher won. But not the laity laid down many thousands, while well, many left, but they were faithful. And there was one little woman in Yorkshire, and she was a mother, and it was forbidden to have mass, it was forbidden to harbor priests. And she was a mother of young children, and she used to let the priests come in. She would instruct the children, they kind of had an underground church. Priests would say mass. And an informer came in, and he, of course, um, revealed that she was breaking the law of the land. Well, she was taken to court, to trial, and when the judge saw her, probably being a parent himself or a father, she was heavy with child, she was pregnant. So the, the judge asked her to take the stand and to, to, you know, renounce what she was doing and to make a note. To, uh, that she would never, ever uh, attend the Papish Mass, have anything to do with, with uh, Roman Catholicism. And she knew, she had a young family, and she knew what was happening all over the country. But she went up there, and she took her allegiance, and she said, I will never, ever pass up an opportunity to go to Mass, and I will always take care of the priest. And because of her allegiance and commitment, she was pressed to death. So there were two, two people, the unborn child and herself, but she's a saint today, St. Margaret of York. Now the question I ask all of you sitting here in this church is, if this happened in Canada, where law came out, and you know, we, we think about it, but we are moving so fast in persecution of Christians and Catholics, that it could very easily, when you see what's happening in our parliaments and what's been regularized as laws that are completely immoral and where God's law is cast aside, it's not a very long distance to where we will be persecuted. I mean, just take, for example, the pro-life people. The persecution and young pro-life, I see it in Ireland, I see it in America, I see, you know, the persecution. And all I can tell you, and I don't care what, what your beliefs in politics are, but I'm going to tell you right here, and I'm Irish, but I'm 50 years in America, 
And for the first time in America, we can breathe in thanksgiving that we have a president who is not afraid to stand for pro-life. He may be a rough character. He may be... But we never had a vice president come out to the pro -life. And that's why, you know, don't think that the persecution of Catholics for, like what Margaret Clitheroe had to go through, St. Margaret. But if it happens, what would you do? Would you be willing to die for the Mass? If you were told you can't go to Mass, which many of your brothers and sisters in, in countries abroad are persecuted through Islam, through all these different uh, cults and ISIS and all kinds of people, what would we do? Would you be willing to lay down your life, or would we do? I often think of John the Baptist, you know, um, would, would, um, would they be saying, oh, don't say anything, say nothing, don't get your head cut off, you know? Or do we value the map? Do we see that it's worth dying? Why would those people die for it? I mean, you know, sometimes we try to canonize or to, to talk, you know, there's, there's all kinds of marches and all kinds of, of demonstrations. And it's like us in Ireland. I remember a priest coming to me when a little boy was out. You know, and it is a, a sad thing with, where there's division. There's always going to be uprisings. And, and I remember I was ministering to priests in Ireland. And a child, a boy, about 12, was out pelting the soldiers with, with rocks. And, and so he got in very badly injured, I think, died. And they were making him a martyr. But at 12 o'clock at night, and what was his motive? And you, you find that. But, you know, to die for your faith and to die for helping another to save their life, to have a motivation that is, that is good, you may not even be a Christian, to, who, you want to help your fellow man. To, but violence and anger, all these things are not part of, 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 of die, giving your life for Jesus. Well, Margaret Clitheroe and these women, why did they give it? Now, they give it because through the Holy Spirit, the uneducated people, many of them of Ireland, England, Scotland, and all these countries, may never have the reason theology or know to be able to explain to you the Mass, but they knew. The Holy Spirit taught them that the Mass is worth dying for. There's nothing else, and I, I can say that, you know, there's no greater sacrament. Why? Let's look at it. First of all, you, we all know that the greatest event that ever happened on this universe we live in, the greatest event, many events happened through history, where peace treaties and all kinds of things happen to affect people's lives. But one event happened that affected every human being, and that was when God sent his beloved son, Jesus. We were plunged into sin and darkness. We, we were banned from heaven, sin and death. We were being ruled by the Satan, the enemy, and sin came into the world, and we, there was no way that weak humanity could make reparation or take upon themselves to, to, to redeem us. Nobody. But God didn't do it to the end, fallen angels. But God so loved the world, as it says in Scripture, that he sent his only begotten Son. Jesus came in an extraordinary, he could have come anyway, but he came in the beautiful way of through a virgin Mary, a virgin mother. And he came into a as a little helpless infant. And this is why. You know, brothers and sisters, always remember that the first worship was of the unborn child Jesus. John the Baptist leaped in his mother's womb. An unborn child, Jesus. Jesus came into the world, but his main face was towards Calvary. His mission was to redeem us from sin and death, to break the powers of Satan. That was what he, that was, but on the journey, what Jesus did, as he came, into, he came to in, where he was nobody, 
could say that this wasn't. He was a little child, cared for by a mother. He chose, God chose a foster father, which is another whole story about family life and a mother and a father. God chose to be in, to be in a family like yours and mine. He hid himself in flesh, but he was God and human, both. And on the journey, we know the stories of very little of his infancy, but there's enough to give us a glimpse. But then he begins his public ministry, and he picks. He goes away into the night to pray, and he chooses whom he desired. God chose 12 men. An interesting thing about these 12 men were that they were not perfect, they had, they, they, as it tells us in scriptures, they had all the faults, the sinfulness, the weaknesses, the fears. He didn't choose saint. He didn't choose men. He chose men who he could form. And it was hard. Because to change a Jewish mentality or Greek mentality into what he wanted to found his church on, what he wanted them for. And if we notice all through, he gave them wonderful opportunities. Not just, he didn't just, like, you know, preach to them, but he showed them miracles. He showed them that, you know, when they wanted to call down, they were losing their cool with some of these people who were against him, and they were protecting Jesus. And even Peter, the, the one he was going to make head of the church, he, he wanted to, he had the mind of the world. Like, he was, he loved Jesus. He loved him. But he was being you know what ha can happen to any of us, as as they, that we can take on the mind of the, and so Jesus had to turn and say to him, "Get behind me, Satan! That's not God's way." In other words, he was saying to Peter, "Don't let yourself be attacked." He wasn't making, P Peter wasn't Satan, but Peter could be influenced by the enemy to protect himself. Then. Each one of the apostles had their own struggles. But God chose them. He never lost patience with them. He kept going. And he told them, probably many times, you're not going to understand everything because they couldn't have. And they certainly couldn't have understood, and they didn't. John chapter 6. When he started talking about what was, and when he talked about going up to Calvary. And they were horrified. I mean, he's all powerful. It's weakness to, to, to go to Calvary, to be died. You're, you're all powerful. You can do miracles. But what he did was he slowly, like a school, you know when you have these workshops where you, you and especially with children, where you, you make them do the things so they'll be able to do it. You, to, he challenged the apostles. He made them go out. He, I'm sure he allowed that storm at sea. I'm sure he allowed them to go out of no food to, so that he, they would be able to see what they could do through him. And then Calvary happened. But just before he went to his passion, Passover was coming, the big celebration. And he had, God had his plan. And you know, only God could think of doing this. Only God. It's a, and this is why I say to you that you can't understand the mass in your head. If you start re uh, rationalizing and thinking with your this part, and that's why faith is so important, why prayer is so important, and why you, your faith grows. Because you ha it's a mystery. Mysteries are not explainable in human words. Mysteries are believed even more clearly. Mysteries can be believed than the real thing. Because the Holy Spirit works. Well, what did God do? He gathered these 12 men, not his mother, just the 12 apostles. She had already, she was probably, you know, there all the time, encouraging these men to listen to Jesus. And he celebrated the first Mass, the greatest gift, the institution of the Eucharist, and the ordination of these men. Now, what did that mean? And did they fully understand it that night in that room? And there he had Judas, who left, 
who grieved, who grieved. And that's why we should never, you know, brothers and sisters, sometimes we try to cover up or sometimes we're ashamed because we have heard of the scandals and we see things in the church and we say, no, I don't want to believe that. We're not a church of saints. And, you know, a visionary in, 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 in Germany, wonderful place over there with not very well heard of, but those who know it in Germany, Harlsbach, we met one of the visionaries who's 76, and they were terribly persecuted by masons and all sorts of things happened. They were excommunicated as children. Now it's open, this apparition. But Father Kevin said to her, why the church, did you not ask her lady why you suffered, why you were persecuted by the church? And she said, no, no. It's not the church. The church is my son, the body of Christ. It's the people in the church. Because the people, it's not the church. When somebody does something to you, you know, you, you say, I'm not going back to Mass anymore. I'm not going to. And you say, what? That's only an individual, a sinner like us. So we all have, make mistakes. Now, on that night, he gave them this power. What was the power? And it wasn't given, you know, and this is why, to me, when people talk about who is a right to ordination, I think to myself, nobody, not even the bishop, the pope, the priest, nobody is a right. All these things are God's. God chose whom he desired. He gave them his power to do two un unbelievable. He gave them power to make him present in word and sacrament. Now, what did that mean? That every time these men, after they were ordained and Jesus had given them the words we hear to this very day of consecration, he gave them power to make present the victory. So that Mass, every time you come to Mass, down through the history since Jesus himself, he taught us, as it says in Scripture, they were taught by God. Every Catholic Mass, every Catholic Mass is the reenactment, it is when you walk in this door on a Sunday morning or whenever you come to Mass and the priest blesses us. Patrick Pio said, time ceases because we step, we're in time because we're human beings and we need time, the concept of time. But when you come to Mass, you step out of time to the actual victory. And this is why Satan hates it. Because you are, if you read the Passion, you could say, well, if I was there, this is what I, ah, and I know who Jesus is and all his kindness. No, brothers and sisters, Catholics are present at the victory. That's what the Mass is. It's not entertainment. It's, you know, and after Vatican II, which, thank God, Vatican II happened, a wonderful, wonderful grace in the church. But many people took leeway, and many, many of the people who were very liberal started changing. But the Mass, the Mass, you know, it's not the... the it's great. We need good literature. And thank God we have them and, and beautiful singing and altar boys and all, all these things around. But the main part of the Eucharist can only happen through an ordained Catholic priest. It makes Jesus present. You are present. And that's why the Catholic Church obliges, says to us, you must go to Mass. That they encourage you to go to Mass on a Sunday. Why? Not because God needs you. you know, God doesn't need you, but you need the power of the victory to fight out in that world. And Satan's main thing is to get the Catholic Church closed. That's why in Europe, Catholic churches and places are being sold to, as mosques. Catholics are leaving the church because they don't realize. And that's Satan's ploy. And that's why I say to you, the, why the Eucharist is so powerful, it's not feelings. You don't have, you know, sometimes we go to, to Mass and say, I don't get anything out of it. Yes, of course you do. you got salvation. This is Jesus' way. He made, he made it possible down through the ages of history that it's our victory. He died for you, every one of you. He shed his blood. He gave his body and blood, his passion, death, resurrection, 
and to suffer, were all for us so that we would be liberated in the world. And if you look at every convert, and you know, on, on EWTN, you hear the lives of these, these many converts. Most of those converts were either came through uh, the Eucharist or our Blessed Mother. Because Mary's main purpose, the two great poles in the Catholic churches, the mother and the son. And when your, uh, your mother always want her son to do it, she wants us to come to Jesus. In the, because that, they the same DNA, you know. The mother gives the child, and then she is God the Father. But think about it. This is why at the, when, when, when many left the Catholic Church during the Reformation, and, you know, and for many centuries, people disdained Mary, and very soon the Eucharist left. You leave, you leave uh, Jesus, and you lose Mary. You leave Mary, and you lose Jesus in his real presence. And that, I'm not uh, criticizing. There are many good Christians, and I've spoken to many Christians around the world of other faiths, and this is what I tell them. I say to them, look, I'm a Catholic. I have never deny, and I tell them what I believe. But I say, I don't ask you as a Baptist or a Presbyterian or an Episcopal to be Catholic. I do ask you to be what you profess as a Christian and let me be, but this is what I believe as a Catholic. And I pray that people will come to know. And in EWTN, I'm delighted when I hear, like, Scott Hand and all these great evangelists who are coming into the Catholic Church because of the Holy Eucharist. So that's the first thing I'd say to you, the Eucharist is. It is a, a sacrifice. And in Ireland, do you think, you know, there's a story of a little woman in Galway, and she, it was during the famine, we had a terrible famine in Ireland, and it was man-made, of course, but uh, the Irish died, they went abroad. For, but, you know, there's a story recorded by a Capuchin priest. And he tells how this woman had five sons and a husband. And there was no work for them, and they had very little. But they went away and died. Many of them, the sons never came back. And the mother was left with one little boy and herself. And she, they had very little to eat. She buried her son. He died of starvation. But she crawled. The Sunday bell, the mass bell rang. And she crawled down the road on her knees because she couldn't stand. And she kept crawling until she got to the door. And when she saw the consecration, she said, Thank you, Mary. I've seen your son, Jesus. Thank you. And she died. And the story, I go to Africa and I hear the most unbelievable of how people walk for days. How people get, lie out overnight because they want to come to Mass. I met a leper in one of the leper colonies who had no feet. And he crawled down. He was sacristan in the local church. And he had a big smile and he said to Father Kevin, myself, we're there ministering. He said, you know, we're not really poor. Because these are our mothers and fathers, and these are all these priests. You know, this is the great value. You know, there's more to giving your life as a celibate. All these young missionaries who went over there, who would never be, you know, celibacy is a charism. You know, it's under great debate and everything. But it will never leave the church. There may be married priests, whatever, but celibacy is a great charism. And it's not just not being married. It's you consecrate your sexuality that's beautiful to Jesus for the sake of the kingdom. Well, these young missionaries, two from New York, from all over, and you had many Canadians probably, but these missionaries went to Africa and they brought the greatest gift to those people, the Catholic faith and the Holy Eucharist. And those people told me, we, we had no hands, no noses, but they were ready and said, these are our mothers and fathers. They give life to us. They give birth to us. And this old man crawled every day to get the altar ready. And he was so full of joy, and he said to me, you know, the mass for me. Uh, he, you, you should see him getting things ready with the stumps. But they were full of joy. I went to Malachi. Same thing, Father Damien brought the greatest gift to those people in Malachi. And secondly, before I finish, the mass is communion with Jesus, the victim. Brothers and sisters, 
Receiving Holy Communion is not about anything other than meeting face to face Jesus. And St. Faustina, I think it was in her diary, Jesus told her that people come up to communion as if he's an object. Also, one of the saints, I don't know if it was her or one of the saints that I read, had a vision one day of a house. And it was dirty, and it was all, it was just a mess. And Jesus spoke to the saint and said, this is the soul full of sin, of all kinds, who doesn't prepare, who is not, remember Jesus said it himself, not, it's not, a people. He said, if you love me, you keep my commandments. And he gave us clearly commandments and teachings on everything to do with our moral lives. So it doesn't matter who tries to rationalize and say, you can, you know, well, who is right to hold communion. But he said to the saint, I come but my crucifixion happens again. When I have to go in, it's like having a visitor and really, how would this person think, would, would they think you love them? If they come into a filthy, a just awful, and you don't welcome them. People come to Holy Communion. I, I watched, I was in a parish, and I was absolutely horrified at this, this um, altar boy. He chewed gum the whole time and talked. The priest, I have to say, I hate to use the terminology, he was pretty liberal. He, he added and he did things at the Mass, very disturbing. And see, the Catholic Church has a discipline. And thank God. And your dear St. John Paul, I mean, he, he spoke, he put a beautiful encyclical. Pope Paul VI during the Vatican Council, when he could see that something was going to happen, he wrote an encyclical, beautiful readings. There's a great book, if you ever, it, it's by Father John Harding, S.J., The Eucharist, Our Salvation, I think it's called. I've given out hundreds because it makes you aware. Now, when you go to Holy Communion, then he showed the house, that, then he showed this little house, all beautifully polished and all clean, and the person standing at the door welcoming. And Jesus said, I love to come. I come with joy to the welcome soul, to the soul that welcomes me. You think about it. When we walk up, we meet face, we have communion with Jesus. We, we have, we do even better than what the apostles did because they just were looking at him, but we receive him as into this mystery. It is his body and blood. And in the afternoon, I'll tell you some stories about miracles that I've seen through the Eucharist. But that is communion. When you have struggles in your marriage, when finance, anything. This is why Jesus said to me, tell the people I'm here. I mean, I tell people with cancer, I tell all kinds of people. You wouldn't go to the doctor and if the doctor said, well, you're going to be saved if you take chemotherapy. And you say, oh, no, I'm not going to bother. I'll just do without it. Or medicine, because it's part of, of, of God's... So... No greater gift than communion with Jesus. And in the Catholic Church. And holy bread, it's not holy bread. That's what those who don't believe. We believe through the valid ordination, through the, the apostolic sense, that this host is the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus living. <clears throat> and the last thing, the Eucharist gives us, like St. Beloved St. Francis of Assisi was the one who introduced Eucharistic adoration. He wasn't a priest. He was a deacon, but, you know, Eucharistic adoration is one of the great works of the Holy Spirit in recent times since St. John Paul, who spent hours with the Holy Eucharist, who spent hours in adoration, who never made a decision, who, you know, without really spending time, he would go in and pray before the Blessed Sacrament. And I say to you, I'm going to finish off with a beautiful story about Eucharistic adoration, but I'll say more later. And these are the three things to remember. The Eucharist is, it's the sacrifice, it's communion with Jesus, and it's also to be able to be in his presence at any time. I had the privilege um, 
many, many, many years ago of having a great friendship with the former king of Belgium, King Budwin. And I met King Budwin through Cardinal Sunans, whom I knew well. And over the years, Father Kevin and myself became frequent uh, visitors to the palace, to the king and queen. And uh, Budwin was a saint. He really was a wonderful man. And of course, for him as a king, <clears throat> it was great for him to have somebody that, you know, I, we didn't use any titles. It was all in secret at the time he's dead now, and people know. But I used to go there. I would not, they wouldn't allow you to go in with the vid because we, they wanted to keep it secret because, you know, people say su such one's influence. There's always been this attack. Anybody, and it, I mean, this happens in the beginning, anybody who stands for Jesus or especially in, 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 in leadership. Well, Budwin, anyway, ha told me this story. He said that when he got married to Queen Fabiola, which is quite a story, he used to make, Every day, he would get up in the palace and go down and he'd make three hours of Eucharistic adoration. And he would say to the queen that he was going sunbathing. <laughs> and she would be looking, can you imagine the new bride thinking, Belgium, not even like sunbathing. So she told me herself, she got curious. And where was he? She went down one day and there he is prostrate in front of the tabernacle. And he said to me, you know, Sister Breach, it's like sitting in the sun. He said, you know, if, if the sun is shining in the sky and you're in here, it doesn't do a thing to you. If you ever see people who are, who are, are not allowed to see light or not allowed to get any sun, well, if you go out, the only thing you have to do is to make the effort to get out in the sun. And if you go to Florida, like I did when I went there 50 years ago, I thought, this is wonderful, I'm going to the beach. And uh, it was a dull day, so I thought, ah, it's great, there's no really hot sun. And I got the biggest burn. <laughs> I was like a lobster. And now, I, was, I went out, and he said, you just have to get out there with the intention, you're just going to sit. He said, I go down every morning to the king, and I sit like you would in the sun. And I just said, Jesus, I'm here to adore you, and I'm just here. And he said, after sitting in the sun, people know you've been in the sun, but you feel it. He said, and he said this after he abdicated from the throne for a, because of abortion. He said to me, you know, sometimes we get a big grace early offered to us, and it may be in preparation for something that's going to be asked of us later, whether later in life or early. But he was the king for many years, and he had one thing in the back of his mind, it was coming towards that, was that abortion was going to be introduced. So he, he prayed, we prayed with him, and I used to say to him, no, you don't give in, and he said, don't worry, it's not that simple at all, these, you know, these uh, officials and everything, and he's the, second, uh, the head of state. So the morning came, when he was uh, final day, where it was all passed through the houses and senates, and, and he was to put his, his signature that yesterday it was a crime, and today, because King Budwin said, signed it, it's legal. And he said, I'm not doing it. And they coaxed him and they said, oh, you know, it's your own conscience, we know, but for the public. You ever hear that? You know, privately, I believe in life, but like publicly, I have to give my constituency what they want. Okay? So we abdicated. And long story, but when he came back to the palace, he said, he thought to himself, and he told them, he said, I'm not signing it because I'm not the king. I'm only a figurehead. I have no authority over human life. And he said, that was the moment God said to him, you have remained faithful, and those who declare me before mankind, I will declare before my father. That didn't get out in the papers, his story. And he was just completely free. Now, he attributed to Eucharistic adoration. And that's why I'd say to you, the three things, brothers and sisters, as I finish this talk, please never, ever underestimate the power of the Mass. There are people dying for it. 
there are people. And never say you haven't met Jesus. When people say to me, well, you know, I, I met Jesus in the Pentecost church. Have you ever met Jesus? I say, of course, I meet him every morning. For 57 years, I meet Jesus every single morning. Have you received him as your personal Lord? Well, he's in there. He took over. <laughs> you know, so that's why I say to you here in Ottawa, and I say to you to tell you, never, ever, Give up this treasure. This is the la we have to hold on to it, and we have to pray for our bishops and our priests and our pope that all of us, at this difficult time, because it is a difficult time, that we will not, we will never deter or, or, or get, as you know, Saint Paul said in here, uh, not to be evangelized by the world. You know, to 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 take on the mind of the world. You just say, I may not. Agree. There's a lot of things happen, but there's one thing I know, that I will never, ever forget what Jesus did. He died to set me free in his passion, death, and resurrection. And I have the privilege of going there to that victory every day if I want, if I have priest, and pray for the priest, and pray for Father, Father, um, uh, uh, vocation director yesterday. Pierre, pray for Father Pierre, because he has the job of, he's vocations promoter and director. Pray for vocations in your families, because we need priests. We need holy priests, and we need holy bishops. And thank you, and God bless you.